And the senior executive producer of 48 Hours is none other than Susan Zerinsky, who's a legend, a legend here at CBS. That's right. We call her Z. She's with us now. And over the past few months, we've been putting together a little profile of you, Z. It's part of a new CBSN series we're launching today. It's called Five Minutes with Z. Let's take a look. I have been at CBS. Do I have to say the number of years? We're going to put it up there. If okay. You Unless you really don't want to say All right. It was like great sex. It was the best. And I literally called my dad and I said, I know what I want to do with the rest of my life. I, I, I do find there's one event that was particularly impactful to me and that's 9-11. Because in my whole career, I had gone to cover things and wars but it didn't happen 30 blocks from my office. And so it was a stunning vulnerability that I think we all felt. And it was very difficult to cover because you cover a war, you get on a plane, you go home. It's all normal. This wasn't normal. It was never going to be normal again. I was fired once and I was not allowed out of my contract. And it was a very tough two years because it, it really tested my ability to, to function in a negative environment. And um, I was fired as the uh, senior broadcast producer from the Evening News by the guy that was the executive producer. CBS refused to let me out of my contract, so I, was, um, I actually ran politics that year. And in spite of him telling people not to talk to me, people talked to me, and it was a pretty incredible year. Um, I survived, and the person that fired me is long gone. Now, I used to have his desk, and every day, once a day, I would spit on the desk, and it was amazingly satisfying. In the days after Tiananmen, it was a nightmare, and it was chaotic, martial law. It was, you know, nobody wanted to talk. It was dangerous for us to be on the streets. But a couple of weeks after, a professor calls me, and there was a Chinese uh, dissident. His name was Feng Lijia. They asked if they could come see me. They were trying to get asylum for Feng Lijia. The reality was they thought that he would be arrested and we'd never hear from him again. I hid Feng Lijia for several days. We ended up um, negotiating and taking him to the American Embassy. So I didn't tell the CBS in New York that I was hiding a dissident. Um, and I never look back. I never look back at that decision. The thing that gives me pause about, about journalism in the future, the technology has allowed so many people to be aggregators as opposed to original reporters. Our mission is to report. Our mission is original content. Our mission is to grow the brand. You want to be in as many platforms as you can. If you told me like eight, nine years ago that I'd want to like be in your cell phone, I'd have said, give me some of that crack you're smoking. Now, I'll buy crack for somebody if I can appear on a new platform. As I look back, I think that there were times that I should have given more at home than I did. I feel that you cannot make up that time and the impact will be felt for the rest of my life. Yes. 48 Hours has impact. We get people out of jail. We solve cold cases. I'm proud when we uncover facts. I'm proud if a lawyer sees our show and says, that kid's innocent. I'm going to take that case on pro bono. It's really exciting to have impact. I walked into history. I walked into the greatest seduction of all times. I thought I knew what I wanted to do. It changed the day I walked into CBS. So, Z. 
thank you for being here. This is so great to talk to you. You've and been, thanks for being the guinea pig right, for the first for the project. Very first five minutes with. Uh, you've been here 43 years, and I love the history of news. And so I want you, like, I read somewhere that, you know, when you first started at CBS, it was you and Connie Chung and Marcy McGinnis, and you were these three sort of admin assistants, and you sat in a room, the room that's probably back there where the evening news is, with all these guys smoking coffee, drinking, smoke, uh, drinking coffee, smoking cigarettes, and you guys were given these little tiny desks that you get in, like, elementary school that are attached to the chairs. Is that true? Not quite. All right. Um, <laughs> you know, I was working weekends. I was in college and it was a very exciting time because it was Watergate and you know on Saturday nights all my roommates were going out and getting drunk and <laughs> I was going to stake out the Attorney General of the United States behind a hotel which I thought was really great um, but I did notice something not right away you know it was the Washington Bureau Leslie Stahl and Connie Chung were kind of young reporters and I never thought about being a woman I mean it wasn't in my lexicon right. and I was asked to deliver an envelope to Leslie Stahl's desk and I couldn't find her desk and I couldn't find her desk because her desk and Connie's desk were like Alice through the looking glass and these <laughs> tiny little mini, mini desks in a back hallway and I thought in a hallway I get it I get it but you know Leslie's gone on Connie went on for a great career Leslie is still knocking them dead on 60 minutes and so you know it, it, you'd like to say there are never problems with women and for the most part there aren't but the the evolution of news has changed dramatically and I think it's sexless now, but because you, you do, at, you really, really I you do. Feel that way? Look at CBS's coverage in the war and overseas. Look at the women on the front line. They're places where the men aren't. And um, I won't say anything about bravery, but there's some pretty awesome women on the CBS uh, news staff that I'm proud to call my colleagues. Well, what's some of the advice that you have for young women who are looking to get into the business, especially as you were just talking about the changing nature of news? Well, I, I'm going to make it a sexless answer for women and men. I think the whole career path is dictated by your attitude. And there is nothing that is beneath me. Even today, if somebody needed me to type a script, I'm an awesome typer. I can type as you talk. I literally could transcribe presidents as they talk. The White House used to come to me to fact check their transcripts. <laughs> so the, the reality is never, never feel you're above something. And that every job, even the one I was fired from, I got something out of. I get something from the people I work with. It doesn't matter who they are, what the positions are. I, I kind of grab something from them. In the Chinese world, I kind of take some of their spirit mm. and I incorporate it. And I think that um, enthusiasm and excitement about what you do separates you from the pack. I, you know, I keep thinking I won't be nervous when I come to work. I'm still nervous when I come to work. I think embrace fear. People don't talk about that. People are scared to death. And you know what? They always want to say, oh, I'm, you know, this is fine. I can do it. I've been doing it for a while. Right. Right. Embrace the fear. For me, it's my life. It's like oxygen. It shows you're always being challenged, too. Every single day. I get up really early because I still want to, like, be read in, work out, come here hungry and angry and just attack the world. Do you ever, have you ever thought that, you might do something else in life, or is this what you've always wanted to do? No, I actually wanted to be a Hollywood director oh, when wow. I first started out. But I got, you know, I got stuck. I got, I got bit by the bug at CBS News because, you know, I was a kid in Washington. I was like 19 years old, and and it seemed so important. It really was so impactful because in those days, when it was during the presidency of Richard Nixon, who had done terrible things, and so had his staff. So to see the impact that a journalist could have on the White House and politics, it was just really empowering. And I really liked staking out the Attorney General behind the Jefferson Hotel. <laughs> and I went to every garage in a 50-mile radius of Washington looking for Deep Throat on Saturday night. I didn't have never any, found yeah, him. Yeah, I never found him. Didn't get any dates, right. but I, I did have kind of some adventures with some camera crews. <laughs> that will be part two of Five Minutes with Z. <laughs> Susan Zarinsky, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks.